Thank you for the song. Good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? I suppose that we are all, uh, none of us are wet just like yesterday because there is no more rain today. Um, did you know if any of your friends got sick because of the bad weather? I hope not. Before we start this morning, I want to, first of all, extend my apologies if I have been too hard on the issue of being quiet when we are in worship. My main point is that when we are in worship, we should not be distracted by anything. So if yesterday, maybe my words were quite hard on you, especially to this row, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. I hope I did not make you cry. I'm very sorry. So I just want us that when we come here, we, we realize that this is a place for worship. A place for worship. That is why we take two periods out of our daily classes routine we have time to for this whole week in the morning and in the afternoon to spend time to study the word of god and since this is worship it is expected of everyone to show respect to god not to show respect to the speaker not to show respect to the one taking part but it is our respect to God because we are here, our purpose is worship. And I hope that all of you understand what I mean. And so once again, my apologies if I have been too hard on you. And I hope that from this time on, until we finish on Sabbath, we will continue this atmosphere of worship as soon as we enter into this church. Thank you very much. So brothers and sisters, this morning we're going to talk about, uh, our topic this morning is about tried and true. But before that, I want to issue, address two, two questions that were given to me yesterday. The first question, can we flash it on screen? Yes. Are Adventists allowed to enter fashion industry? Why? Or why not? Maybe I want to ask you first, what is your opinion? Are Adventists allowed to enter fashion industry? Those of you who believe that it is okay, please raise your hand. Okay. For those of you who believe that it is not okay, please raise your right hand. Okay. First of all, we have to clarify this issue. This is in relation to the, to the, how many principles did we study yesterday? Six principles of a, a right appearance. First of all, let me, let me state this. Those principles are guidelines, okay? They are principles, they are guidelines. We, we quoted biblical passages that support those principles. And those principles are not necessarily to bind us, to bind us that we should really be like that. Why? Because we, we have the right to choose of what we will follow. Okay? Second, in order to enter the fashion industry, we can, we can have a range of involvement inside. Okay? For example, if you are a dressmaker, seamstress, is that in the fashion industry? Well, in one way it is, because you are making dresses for people, okay? And many people will come to bring a kind of dress that they like from an artist and ask the seamstress, I want the dress to be something like this. So the seamstress is a part of the fashion industry whether you like it or not. Because even fashion designers 
when they come up with a fashion with a design who will do the who will make the dress the seamstress okay now if we are, if this question is probably referring to being in the fashion industry probably as a ramp model probably as a fashion designer i don't know but assuming that this is what the question is asking about some of us has raised the, raised our hand and we say yes it is okay i totally agree with you it is okay but we have to keep in mind that whatever our involvement there we follow if you are a christian if you are an adventist let us follow the guidelines i know you know i know in indonesia there are pastors children you know who who are in somewhere in a fashion industry they become ramp models they become ramp models very young they follow competitions and everything well i don't see anything wrong with that i see it is wrong if they start dressing up in the dresses that we describe which will which will not be according to the six principles another thing that i want to mention in okay, it's okay because it is it is uh, it is the way that we will project ourselves when we are involved in the fashion industry it is how our attitude is if we are involved in the fashion industry in whatever capacity if we still keep on the principles of christians while we are doing while we are involved in this activity then i don't think i don't think i see anything wrong with that for those of us who say no well i should agree also with you you know why because if you are involved in the fashion industry there may be times that you will be asked to break the fourth commandment do you see where i'm going there will be times when you will be asked to come on a road show you have to perform on friday night or the whole saturday there will be times when you will be asked to do things that will be that will be out of our of our beliefs early in the morning they will serve you sir it's very cold drink coffee for the young for the young men they'll say sir ang painit alcohol those things will force us to answer the question as a no however the main principle that we want to address here is that it is your choice if you want to enter fashion industry because you are christians you know the right principles of christian living of Ad seventh day adventist of what we believe then it is your choice if maybe you are in there and you think that you can still abide by what your beliefs are what your moral values are then why not okay if you if the person who is asking this question needs to talk more about it want to further ask quest more questions you're welcome to see me in the guidance office right after this i'll be here the whole day so after this 9 to 10 to 11 i will be there feel free to come and talk to me we have a second uh, uh, question what is the role of appearance in our salvation what is god more concerned on our attitude rather than our appearance can we not enter into kingdom of god's into god's kingdom if we do not follow the principles you have mentioned okay the first there are three questions actually here the first question what is the role of please don't don't uh, remove that it's okay even if it's wrong just uh, project it what is the role of our appearance in our salvation i don't think that there is a role of appearance in the salvation but i think there is something underlying this that is deeper than appearance why should we project uh, 
godly appearance? Why should we project Christ-like appearance in our daily lives? Because we love God. Because we want to follow His commandments. Okay? So, I don't think per se, uh, appearance per se is not a requirement for salvation. Please keep that in mind. The second question, is God more concerned on our attitude rather than our appearance? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes. God is more concerned about our attitude. You say yes. Okay. God is more concerned about our attitude rather than our appearance. If our attitude to God is correct according to what He, according to what he says in the Bible, then automatically our appearance will conform to the standards that we have discussed, isn't it? If you say, if you say that our, uh, our attitude is important, but our attitude is an attitude of pride, of attitude of selfishness, do you think God will also consider that as obedience to His laws? Of to, to his commandments? I don't think so. And so, the third question is, can we not enter into the kingdom of God if we do not follow the six principles? Will you go to hell if you don't follow that? No, you'll not go to hell. And in our study yesterday, I never mentioned that this was, that this was, uh, an issue of salvation. No, it is not an issue of salvation. Our appearance is not an issue of salvation. I think there was, there is still something missing here. There is another part of this question that was not typed. Can you just, uh, uh, it will take time for you to type. Let me, let me just go down. Okay, the last, the last part of this she, he or she asked, Diba Roman said, whoever calls in the name of God will be saved. Okay, we are basing now this on a Bible verse. Whoever called in the name of God will be saved. Okay. Let me illustrate this like this. If If you get sick, you get sick, you want to get well. So you go to your doctor and you call, doctor, doctor, I want to get well. And the doctor says, oh, okay, you want to get well. I see that you are coughing. I see that you got wet. Uh, you." You play badminton, you play basketball, you get very wet, and uh, which has caused you to contract uh, cold. Okay, yes, I will make you well. You take this medicine three times a day. So you go home. You want to get well. You have already called the doctor. You have already visited the doctor. Are you going to get well by the mere fact of visiting the doctor? Let me, let me hear your answer. Are you going to get well by the mere fact of visiting the doctor? You will not. How will you get well? Following what the doctor asks you to do. Okay? The doctor asks you to take medicine. Probably the doctor even advised you to refrain from uh, playing outside and getting wet and probably the doctor also advised you to uh, not stop eating sweets so that not to prolong your cough or anything else so if this passage yes it is correct whoever calls in the name of God will be saved Romans 10 13 yeah for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved what does the call, what, what does the word here mean? Call. The word call here means that we have to pray in faith for salvation. 
It is not merely saying, Lord, Lord, I want to be saved. And you continue sinning, you continue doing what is wrong, and you will be saved. And so this concept, I want, it, I want to clarify this concept. If we want to be saved, we call on the Lord. We pray, God, I want to be saved. Please help me. When we pray to that, okay, let, let's, let's open this. Uh, when we pray, we ask, we ask to be saved. Yes, God will hear us. God will hear us. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. After we pray, after we pray to ask for, to ask for salvation from God, there are still other things that we shall do. We should, we should follow His instructions. If we call, if we, if we call upon the Lord to be saved, we after that follow what God wants us to do. And so, yes, our answer to these questions are the role of appearance does not make us saved. God is concerned with our attitude. Yes, not our appearance. Therefore, an attitude that is complying with God's desire in us will automatically make our appearance pleasing to God. And then, six principles will not help us to go into God's kingdom. No, it will not. Because you have the right to choose. And then, whosoever calls in the name of God, they will be saved, yes, but not merely calling, but being proactive after calling, accepting Jesus Christ, and then following His commandments for us. I hope this uh, answers the question. And so again, if you feel that you need to follow up on these questions, please feel free to see me later on. Okay, so let us uh, continue with our study. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you that this morning we can start our study to learn about Jesus, to learn about how he has set an example for us, although he was tempted, but he still did not sin and became victorious. And we want to follow that example because we want to find our identity in you. Help us this morning. Give us the spirit of meekness to understand. Open our hearts. Grant us your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a story about how Eskimos try to hunt for wolves. You know, in uh, that area, in Alaska, meat will be a main food for them because they have no kangkong, they have no green beans that grow in an icy climate. So for them to stay alive, they have to eat wolves. And they eat, they eat the meat, they use the, they use the fur to warm them, and it makes so kind, many, many functions. And so they, in order to kill a wolf, they have devised a very ingenious plan. They will get a blade of spear, they will coat it in blood, that spear, and dip it in water. Once they dip it in the water, as soon as it comes out, it will freeze and it will form a thin layer of ice, which is coated in blood. A blood that is become ice. Then they will dip it again in blood, coat it again with blood, dip it again in the water. They do this process several times until it becomes a thick layer of blood popsicle. And they will get that spearhead, they'll put it in the snow, they will hide the, the bottom of the spear and they will make it protrude like that in the snow and then they will just wait. And then they will wait. Wolves, naturally, will be attracted by the scent of blood. By instinct, they will come to blood. And so, wolves will come to this 
to this spear that has been coated in blood, frozen blood, and they will start licking that spear. They will start licking. They find it delicious. They continue licking. Now, what do you do when you lick ice? In, uh, if you try, uh, I don't want you to do this at home, but if you try to go put your head in the freezer and lick a popsicle inside the freezer, what do you think will happen to your tongue? It will get stuck. It will first get numb. Yeah? It will get numb. So the wolf will keep on licking until the, the, the tongue gets numb. And it keeps on enjoying because as soon as it swallows oh, its blood, it keeps on licking. Until, until he runs out of blood. And what is next he is licking? What is it that he is licking next? He is licking the spear, which is sharp. And once he licks the sharp spear, it will create a cut in his tongue and blood will start coming out from his tongue. And he keeps on swallowing. Oh, there's more blood. He keeps on licking the blood. So he keeps on licking and drinking his own blood because it tastes good for him. He doesn't feel the pain because his tongue is numb. And so what will the Eskimos do? They will just wait until such a time when the wolf actually dropped dead because he keeps on drinking his own blood. You see, temptation sometimes is like this, you know? Temptation is sometimes like this. We will give in to the forces of temptation, and then we keep on craving for more, craving for more, until we are numb from the workings of the Holy Spirit, and then we finally fall into the trap. Okay. Today, we're going to study about Jesus. Matthew 3 verse 16 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water, and at, at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like the dove. Matthew 3 verse 16 tells the story of Jesus baptized by John the Baptist. Right after Jesus was baptized, Right after he was baptized, a voice from heaven said in verse 17, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And the story continues in Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, on purpose, went to the desert for, for the main purpose of being tempted? Now, I guess this should not be recommended for each, uh, each of us to try. Putting ourselves on purpose to be tempted. You know why? Because many times, once we are tempted, we give in to the temptation, right? Just like this man. He, he goes to, he, go, he passes by a nightclub. He hears the music, do, 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 you know? This is not like the 20 pesos commercial, no. So he hears the music, so he went near, he went near. Oh, the music is nice. He wants to dance. And he prayed like this. Lord, please, do not deliver me into temptation. But he didn't go. He stayed there. And he kept on hearing. Do, 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 do. Oh, and comes, here comes along a beautiful lady and say, Sir, pass up tayo. Oh, and then when he saw a beautiful lady, he went in and he prayed, Lord, my will be done. Did you get it? Not your will be done. My will be done. Temptation. He put himself there, but he, he is not Jesus. Here, Jesus went on purpose to be tempted by the devil. And as soon as he arrived there, we can see the whole story in chapter 4. He says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was 
hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And so as soon as Jesus arrived there, he, he was tempted by, by the devil. But do you think that actually, as soon as he arrived there, he went under a tree and started to sit down and then started waiting and waiting. Do you think that's what he did? And Satan just tempted him 40 days later? I don't think so. As soon as Jesus arrived there, that very moment he was already faced with devil's temptation. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Men do not live on bread alone. And so the temptation starts coming. It starts coming. And then, this next one came. The second temptation. The third temptation came. But do you think Jesus gave in and said, My will be done? If you have been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, you are very hungry. But, and you have the power to create food. And somebody come along and say, Hey, you are hungry. Let me see your powers. What would you do? He would probably immediately say, Sure, I'm hungry. I will eat. Jesus had that power to do so. But he answered the, the devil, Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The second temptation came, and he was brought to the holy city. Let him stand at the highest point. And then, Satan said, If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Do you think Jesus had, had the power to fall down, and then maybe levit, levitate, not falling down on the ground? Yes, He does. Yes, He does. But He answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. On the third time, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, all gifts I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And at this time, Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. At this point in time, Jesus became victorious because in the next verse, verse 11, it says, Then the devil left him. Then the devil left him. And angels attended him. We see in this story of how Jesus was tempted. He went there as a human, 100% human. He did not go there as Jesus, the Son of God. He went there as a human because he wanted to set an example for the people later that will call themselves Christians, followers of Christ, that it is okay to be tempted. Do you think when you are tempted, it is already a sin? When you are tempted, is it already a sin? Is temptation a sin, actually? No. Temptation is not a sin. Because temptation is given to you, though how you will respond to the temptation will define it as a sin or not. Right? Keep that in mind. So Jesus showed his humanity when he was tempted and he was victorious. He was victorious. And so I want to bring you 
to this matter of temptation. We have seen that Jesus was victorious when he was tempted. When he was tempted. So I want to share with you a definition of temptation. George Batrick, a pastor of Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, he defined temptation as temptation is a fork in the road. Temptation is a fork in the road. It is an opportunity for rising as well for falling. A fork in the road, meaning when you are traveling straight on a road, there is a road that will go left and there is a road that will go right. At that point in time, you will decide, are you going to go straight or are you going to go left or are you going to go right? Your choice when faced with temptation to go left or right or continue on the right path will determine, will determine you being lifted up or going deeper into your sins. There are two purposes of temptation. The first one is the purpose of temptation is to undermine God's plan and God's will. Genesis 3 verses 4 to 5. Genesis 3 verses 4 to 5. It says here, You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Is it God's will for us to become like God? No. Lucifer wanted to become like God. That's why he was thrown out of heaven. Because he wanted to become like God. It is not God's will. It is not God's plan to be like Him, to become like Him. Although it is God's plan to make us follow the pattern. We are all created in God's image. And because that image has already been broken because of sin, He wants to restore that image in us through salvation when we our bodies will be glorified when we reach heaven and we will live eternally that is actually God's plan so the first the first purpose is to undermine God's plan the second purpose of temptation is to stray man from God's way we will see in John chapter 10 verse 10 it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. God wants to give us life. Not like a thief that will steal. And so you see these two purposes. To undermine God's plan, to stray away from God's way. When temptation arises, man usually, uh, man usually responds in three ways. The primary method for man in dealing with temptation is simply to give in to it. You know, in Indonesia, we are taught in the Adventist church that watching movies is a sin. I don't know if, may, if we still hold these values. But I was brought up as a pastor's kid. My father was a pastor. I, I went to a boarding school for three years. In a senior boarding school, I went there for three years. All my classmates, all my roommates, every night, they will sneak out of a hole in the window and they will go and watch in the Sinehan, down right uh, around three kilometers from our, our campus. At the time, it was 1990. At the time, 
The movies of uh, Jet Li was very popular once upon a time in China. They will go there every night. They will come home after 12. Our room check was at 9. They will come home. Uh, they will leave after the room check and they will come home after 12. Every time they go, they say, Brian, you don't want to come? I said, no, it's okay, I will sleep. I never gave in to that temptation when I was in high school. After high school, I came here to Ayas. I came here to Ayas. And I started taking Bachelor of Theology. Oh, I wanted to become a pastor. When I arrived here, my friends told me, Brian, come on, let's go. Let's go to Manila. We will watch a movie. I said, oh no, I am studying to become a pastor. That is a sin. So I never went there. But finally, he said, my friend knew my weakness. I love to eat. So he said, Brian, why don't you come to Manila and then we will eat. Okay, I said, I'll go in there. So one Sunday, I took a bus, went to Manila and met her in uh, Makati Cinema Square. I told her, why are we meeting here? Oh yeah, we will eat here, here. That's a nice restaurant. So we ate. After we eat, come uh, one, one, oh, another friend and he said, oh, right, you finished eating? Yeah. Oh, now we plan to go and watch. There is this movie. At the time, I remember it was Jurassic Park. And so I said, oh, no, thank you. I will, I already ate. I, I think I'm going home. Thank you for the food. No, 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 no. You have to come and watch with us. There is nothing wrong in watching movie. So they stated, you know, what is the say, what is the difference of you watching a VHS in your house and what is the difference of watching it in a bigger screen? Nothing is different. In the VHS, it is not censored. In the movie house, it is censored. That is their logic. So after fi finally persuading me, I finally went with them. But I said, no, maybe not Jurassic Park. Why? Yeah, because I know oh, this is very wrong. Cannot be. Okay, okay, okay. How about a children's movie? At that time, it was showing Dennis the Menace. So, along with the small children, we lined up and bought a ticket and went inside to watch Dennis the Menace. The one who is calling, Mr. Wilson. You know, that movie. So, I went inside. I sat down and then there was still this commercial. And at this time, my heart was beating very fast. I was very scared. This is my first time to give in to this kind of temptation. I was so scared. I was sweating. It was very cold, but I was sweating. And I said, what if, what if my professor from IAS will just peep from the door and say, oh, there's a BTH student inside. So scared. And finally, the movie started. And they said, hey, what's wrong, man? Enjoy the movie. So I watch. Every time somebody moves, I look. Oh, it might be my professor. I was so scared. The fact, the point is, I did not enjoy that first movie. Went home. Then the next week, my friend said, Hey, Brian, you want to eat again? Oh, sure, I want to eat. I went down to Manila again. There again, in Makati Cinema Square. He said, Oh, let's eat here. Then we will go to Greenbelt. So I went with them and said, Okay, we will watch the movie now. I said, Oh, no, that's enough. But you already watched last week. Eh? So I said, Okay, let's go. The second time I said, I forgot now the title, but I, I only remember the first one. That's only the first time you see and you remember. But second time I sit down, oh, I was still scared, but I was becoming more relaxed. Becoming more relaxed. The second time I went home, the third week they called me up, oh, Brian, come, we will watch. They didn't ask me to eat now. Watch. I went down. We watch and say, after we watch, we eat. The third movie, oh, I find it. Oh, this is a nice place. It's cool. Yeah? The movie is nice. Oh, it's nice. I like it. No more. I don't feel uncomfortable anymore. The fourth time, they did not call. I called them. I said, hey, when are we going to watch? Aha. Aha. So you see the process, the process of giving in to temptation. I don't know if you have experienced this kind of experience. Huh? Have you ever tried to give in to temptation and you feel like what I felt the first time I watched a movie? Have you ever felt this kind of experience? Yes. And so you see, 
The first time we give in to the temptation, we still feel very bad about it. Oh, we say, oh God, I'm so sorry. You know, actually the first time I watched, I went home and I said, God, I'm sorry. I cannot become a pastor anymore because I already watched a movie. You know, later on I found out many of my classmates also taking me days. They were watching movies also. But that was not the point. The point is, when you give in to temptation, first you will feel bad about it. But gradually, you know, the sin of accommodating a sin is actually making you numb like the wolf. You remember? You keep on licking it. Oh, finally it becomes more comfortable. You fail to realize that your, your mind has become numb. The Holy Spirit which is saying, yeah, it is wrong, it is wrong. Finally, no more. You are like being injected with anesthesia. So you see, my friends, when we are faced into temptation, the first thing we do is we give in. Second thing, second thing, they try to avoid it. They try to fight it. Like me, in the first time, in the first stage of my life, I tried fighting this sin of watching movie. I, I, I always say, no, I'm sorry, I have to sleep. I want to wake up early. You guys go ahead and watch I fight over and over and over because I know I cannot overcome this nature. But because I was just fighting it with my own will, because it has been a tradition that I was brought up that way, because all my Adventist friends don't watch movie, I was just fighting it because it is my will. And what happened? Finally, I give in. But then there is the third one. The third one, when we are faced with temptation, it is we try to overcome it through the power of Jesus Christ. When we, this kind of people, they overcome through the power of Jesus Christ, it becomes victory. It may become like a wishful thinking for most of us, but I believe this can become a reality for each one of us. When we are faced with temptation, we ask for God, Jesus to help us. And I know we can be victorious like Him when He was tempted in the desert. And so for this uh, last uh, five, six minutes, I want to give you tips on how we can overcome temptation victorious through the power that Jesus Christ gives us. First of all, we have to prepare. We have to prepare ourselves. The Bible pictures temptation and struggle as a battlefield. It is fighting against temptation. And if you want to succeed in the battle, you need to prepare. Okay? How do you prepare? Get ready for the battle. Get ready for the battle. And then we have to watch and pray. Let's see this. Mark 14. Mark 14, verses 14, uh, verse 38. Mark 14, verse 38 says, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And that is how I was. Because I was just using my own strength. Watch and pray. Be alert and self-control. 1 Peter 5 to 8. I hope you are writing this down. Be alert and self-control. 1 Peter 5 and 8. And then be strong in faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. So the first step is to prepare yourself. The second step is to perseverance and endurance. Many times when there is a battle, they, people get tired. Just like us, when we are fighting a temptation, one day we will surely give in because we get tired. And so we need perseverance, we need endurance so we can continue resisting temptation. That's the second step. And the third step is to plan, to have a strategy, to have a strategy to overcome the temptation. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 13. Write it down, please. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. Maybe some of you have memorized this. 
No temptation has seized you except what is common to men. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you bear, what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And so the strategy based on this verse, we can see that the first strategy is to be humble and resist. To be humble and resist. James 4 verse 7. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Why is being humble important? Because if we are not humble, it is hard for us to accept what Jesus is saying to us. If we are proud, if we are arrogant, we know that we are not supposed to do this, but because we are proud, we say, okay, we will just do it. Because we are not humble. We do not show our humility to God. And then the second step in the strategy is to retreat. In a battle, you are supposed to move forward. But our strategy for resisting temptation is to retreat. 2 Timothy 2 verse 22. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. You see examples in the Bible, when they, well, some Bible characters like Joseph, when he was tempted by the wife of uh, Potiphar. Did he give in? No, he ran away from it. And so the strategy to win this battle is not to continue forward and fight, but to flee from it. And that is the strategy. And so my dear friends, when we are faced with temptation, we may respond into these three responses that I have shared. The first response, second response, the third response. I want to encourage you to go and resort to the third response. Instead of giving in as a first in the first response, we go to the third response. To resist it with the power of Jesus Christ. And that is why we are called Christians. That is why we find our identity in Christ. And above all, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to work in us so that we can have this power to exist. I want to close with a story. Once upon a time, there was toad and frog. Toad baked some cookies and he said, Mmm, these cookies smell very good. He ate one. Oh, it tastes even better. So Toad ran to Frog's house and he said, Frog, Frog, taste these cookies I have made. So Frog ate one of the cookies and he said, Toad, these are the best cookies I have ever eaten. So frog and toad, they sat down and they started eating the cookies, one cookie after the other. And frog said, you know toad, with this, with this much cookies that we are eating, we will soon get sick. There's too much. And toad said, you are right. Let us eat one last cookie and then we will stop. Frog and toad ate one last cookie. There were still many left in the bowl. And Toad said to the frog, Frog, let us eat one last cookie and then we will stop. So they ate one very last cookie. We must stop eating, cried Toad, as he ate another one. Yes, said Frog, reaching for a cookie. We need willpower. What is willpower? asked Todd. Willpower is trying hard not to do something you really want to do, said Frog. Oh, you mean like trying hard not to eat all these cookies? Asked Toad. Right, said Frog. So Frog put the cookies in a box and he said, There, now we will not eat any more cookies. But we can open the box, Toad said. That is true, said Frog. So far, Frog got a string and tied the string around the box. There. Now we will not eat any more cookies. But 
we can cut the string and open the box, said Toad. That is true, said Frog. Frog got a ladder and he put the box on a high shelf. There, said Frog, now we will not eat any more cookies. But we can climb the ladder and take the box down from the shelf and cut the string and open the box, said Toad. That is true, said Frog. So Frog climbed the ladder, took the box down from the shelf, he cut the string and opened the box. Frog went, Frog took the box outside, and he shouted in a loud voice, Hey birds, here are cookies. Birds came from everywhere. They picked up all the cookies in their beaks and flew away. Now we have no more cookies to eat, Toad said sadly. Not even one. Yes, said Frog. But we have lots and lots of willpower. You may keep it all, Frog, said Toad. I'm going home now to bake a cake. I hope this illustration drives something into our hearts. As young people, so that we may resist temptation, have willpower, and respond in a way that will make us follow Christ's example, to be victorious when we are faced with temptation. May God bless each one of us. I want to pray for you. Please raise, I will pray, so that we will take this lesson today, so that we will come out tried and true. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for our lesson that we have learned. That we want to become just like Jesus. Because we identify ourselves as Christians, as followers of you. We want to be just like Jesus. When tempted, he was victorious. We have seen some tips that will help us be victorious when we are tempted. And so as young people, we need power from you so that we can be able to practice these habits, these strategies, and we can be winners just like Jesus when faced with temptation. And so I pray that you will bless each one of us as young people so that we may be empowered by your Holy Spirit every day of our lives as we face many temptations, the temptations of friends influencing us to drink drinks that are not for us, to smoke tobacco and cigarettes, to read materials that are not for us, to view things on the internet that is not appropriate for a Christian. As we face all these temptations, please help us. Give us the power to resist. Help us to practice the strategy and flee from temptation. And we will be victorious like Christ. Help us, dear Father. Bless the teachers also that are with us. So the teachers can continue to encourage us to become winners in our battle against them. Accept us as we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may see us.